board member um, of Prescott Audubon, and we're very excited about tonight. Eric's got a wonderful program for us. Um, and first, we want Carly to talk up from the National History Institute. She's got a couple of announcements that she'd like to make. Carly. Hello, everyone. If we haven't met before, my name is Carly. I'm the communication coordinator for the Natural History Institute, which is a nonprofit house in this building. And I just wanted to let you all know that this Friday from 10 a.m. to noon, we're hosting Opinion J workshop in conjunction with Audubon Southwest. So if you'd like to, to sign up for that and be trained on how you can monitor Pinion J populations in our area just using an app on your phone, you can go to the naturalhistoryinstitute.org Natural slash events and sign up for it there, or you can just talk to me after the event and I can get you signed up. Okay. Thank you, Carly. Um, um, Eric, thank you for being here tonight. I mean, we, I knew we were going to have a big crowd, especially when many of us have not been to the Galapagos Islands or to Ecuador. I mean, kind of the birding mecca. <laughs> so, um, um, Eric is a Prescott councilman. He's also the owner of The Lookout and uh, a birding expert extraordinaire, and we're lucky to have him tonight. Um, earlier this year, Eric participated in a natural history trip organized by Tom Fleshner, correct, is that it, and Edie Dillon. The 21-day trip provided visits to a variety of habitats, including the Galapagos Islands, the Andes, and time in cloud forests, rainforests, and in the Amazon basin. Wow, how exciting. While the trip was not specifically focused on birds, Eric was hyper-focused on birds, of course. <laughs> Of course, and much to his delight, he observed 384 species. That's amazing. And I'm sure that you were all prepped for that trip, weren't you? Uh-huh. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, I did an Audubon program here, I don't know, a year ago, two years ago, you might recall. So it's a pleasure to be back. I really do encourage you, if you get a chance, to come up and take a look at some of the show and tell that I brought. Um, the, the thing that I spent a lot of time in preparation for the trip is, is this particular book. So interestingly, I had bought, purchased this book um, a couple of years ago in anticipation that someday I will go to the Ecuador. And I took it to A&E Reprographics, had him take the binding off, had him spiral bind it so it would lay flat. And then I proceeded to make little tabs for all the different families of birds, like cuckoos, swifts, hummingbirds, trogons, kingfishers, motmots, puffbirds, toucans, wood creepers, on, on, and on, and on. Um, and then I cut them out, and then I laminated them, and then I taped them into the book. <laughs> and, and then I went through and I drew lines on every page to separate the names and the species, the males and the females, and so I could tell what was what. And so this was my field guide. And Gail and I left on Friday, January 26, flew to Houston. That was our first leg of our flight. I stopped in a store to get a treat. I set this down to pay, oh. and I left. And I got to our gate for our flight to Ecuador. This is a true story. And it was about 30 minutes after I had left that little shop, which was near where we disembarked from our first flight. We had to walk a long ways in the Houston airport to get to the next flight. And I all of a sudden realized, my book! I don't have my book! And I had spent literally probably hundreds of hours doing this and preparing, and this was going to be my field guide for the trip. And I went to the gate, and I said, can you call and see if you can get it? And they're like, no, but you have enough time to get back there. And so I literally walked the entire way to that store, and they had it behind the counter. <laughs> so that was a real blessing. And then I had to walk back to our gate and get on our flight. So, oh, what's the name of the book? No, what's your name? Oh, what's my name in the book? No. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> but I also brought, brought my notes, not that you could read them, but I brought my field notes, uh, mostly list of birds that we were observing as we were going throughout the day, Hand, handwriting, sometimes as fast and furious as I could. Uh, because that's how it is when you're in the tropics. And then I compiled it after I got home, put it all into eBird, but here's every species I saw, and there's eight pages, single space of the different birds. So if you want to take some time and look at some of the things that I brought back for show and tell, please take time afterwards. 
I know, I'm such a slacker. Uh, so before I start on the trip, I had a customer come in. I'm going to start this on this side, this on this side. Because we used to talk about rare birds. We used to say, anybody seen anything unusual lately at the beginning of an Audubon meeting? So I had a customer come in last week. I was in the office, and I could hear her coming in the double electric doors. And she said, who's the bird expert around here? <laughs> and in about 15 seconds, she was at my door, because I said, he's down in the office. Go down there, and he's in the office. And she had a picture on her phone of a bird. She's like, we cannot identify this. It's in our yard. I saw it today. I saw it yesterday. Don't know what it is. And I knew immediately what it was. It was a um, varied thrush. And so she just happened to come in today. Why are you laughing, Gail? <laughs> All right, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> Gail was the classic non-birder on our trip. <laughs> so she's laughing about my excitement of birds. Um, actually, I shared my binoculars a lot with Gail, like trying to get her interested in birding. Thank you. Thank you. That's because I had more than one pair of binoculars. <laughs> so this is an example of what I brought. I literally had this with me. So I, I broke this down and, and put it in my backpack and had it on the plane with me in my carry-on. And then I had my personal pair of binoculars, which was like a backup, because then I also took another pair of binoculars, which is the brand new AX Visio from Swarovski, which is the first smart binocular in the world. And so I took that on the trip too. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But let's talk about the trip. Um, so the trip was organized by Tom and Edie. Da -da -da -da. They're sitting right here in the front row. <laughs> well, you need top billing because you made it happen. And the trip is going to happen again next year. So if my presentation is sufficiently interesting, you might want to grab a flyer. They're on the end of the table. And uh, they'd be happy to talk to you. They're here tonight. And uh, they're going to be doing the trip again. So I just want to share that with you. It really is a natural history trip. It is not designed as a, a birding trip per se, although birding is a, a very large part of it. Um, I shouldn't tell these stories because I'm making a fool of myself, but for example, one day we went to this native village along the Rio Napo, and I gave these binoculars to the guides who were kind of standing outside during the presentation. It's like, if you see anything good, come get me. And I was sat in the back of the, the little hut that we were in for this cooking demonstration by these native people. And every once in a while, they'd step inside. Like, and I would run outside. Like, and then I'd go back in, because I didn't want to miss a bird. You've, you've heard of FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Uh, there might have been a really good bird, huh, Gail, that, that you'd miss. Yes, there was. Good job. All right. So. Um, the leaves grow really big in Ecuador, uh, in case you didn't know. But uh, this is in the botanical gardens in Quito. This is my wife, Gayla, if you can't tell. Uh, so I just, I'm kind of going in order, but I'm really not. I had a really hard time preparing for this presentation because it was a 21-day trip, and I'm going to talk to you for 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and do some questions and answer. And I'm a hobbyist. I'm not. I've never had any education with birding. It's just a hobby. It's my passion. It's my love. In fact, when we'd been on the trip for about eight days, one of the guys on the trip, Sam, came up to me and goes, I've been watching you instead of watching the birds. And it's just like, what is it that just drives you? Why are you so interested in birds? And, and, and we had an interesting conversation. But um, it was hard to narrow down how to present the trip. So we arrived on a Saturday morning at about 1 in the morning. By the time we got through Immigrations and Customs and got a taxi and got to our hotel, it was like 3 in the morning, Saturday. And this is part of the press contingency. We have quite a few people here today that were a part of that trip. And we took a tram, the Teleferico, from uh, Quito, which is about 9,350 feet, Quito, capital of Ecuador, and we took the tram up to about 12,800 feet, something like that. And um, I did some birding, uh, just in case you were wondering what I did up there. So when I was thinking about the trip, I thought, well, I'm going to boil it down to people, places, 
and birds. You know, kind of give you an overview of my experience, so you're going to see it from my perspective. I mean, anybody that were to present a program on this trip would probably have a different take on it, but this is my take on it. One of the things I noticed in Ecuador was lots of incredible murals, lots of art. I, I was really impressed by that. Uh, this is in Quito, Old Town. Narrow streets, cobblestone, brightly colored, uh, very pretty. Here's sort of the Prescott group again. Um, lots of churches. Um, one of the, the first day that the trip, the first full day of the trip, we did more of, um, what would you call it? Um, cultural, cultural, you know, we went around old, old town, Quito, visited several churches. We went to the Gold Church, which was amazing if you've never been to the Gold Church. Um, and then, I'm jumping ahead, but I'm just, I'm doing people. Um, you know, this is an example of our group in canoes that were being paddled in the Amazon. Um, it was really a totally amazing experience to go to all these different habitats and places. This is in the Amazon basin, part of our group. Um, we had 17 participants, and then Tom and Edie, so that made a total of 19. I think nine of the 17 were from Prescott. Um, the, uh, it rained a lot. One day I asked the guy at, at one of the lodges, I could, when's the dry season? And he said, this is the dry season. <laughs> okay, well, it rained for hours. Um, I'm in the back using a laser pointer that Tom brought to like, point, get, help people get on birds. So um, we did lots of birding, obviously. Uh, this is the OSHA-approved way of getting on a boat in Ecuador, so I just thought I'd share it with you. So this is at the Rio Napo, and we had taken a bus like this for several hours, and we got down to the Rio Napo, and we were to board a boat that was going to then take us down the Rio Napo, and this is how we got on the boat, so I just thought that was kind of funny. Uh, you wouldn't see that in the United States. Uh, this is an example of a waterfall in the Banos area, and this is called the Devil's Cauldron. Um, I took that video, and um, just really an incredible place. It was actually here that we saw uh, several cock of the rock nest, and some saw some cock of the rock females in this particular habitat, right at this location. Um, I'm going to jump into the Galapagos because after we arrived in Quito, we stayed for a day or two, did the cultural part in downtown, Old Town, Quito, and we flew out to the Galapagos. So this is at the Galapagos airport. And it's really funny because there's a lot of similarities in the um, plants to the desert, of the Sonoran Desert. Like the tree behind here looks almost exactly like one of our Palo Verde trees that grows in the Sonoran Desert. Um, this is the boat we were on. We really roughed it. It was just, I think that's Delisa up there like modeling, you know. I think, I think that's you. Okay. So um, when we flew into the Galapagos, we transferred by bus down to a dock that then we took a little panga, which is the next slide. And the panga was how we would go from land to the boat and from the boat to land. And so we would do this several times a day. We'd have these little offshore excursions. And um, that's how we got around in the Galapagos. I think the Galapagos was a lot different than what I anticipated. No offense. Um, this is what it looked like in reality. You know, I mean, um, lots of lava flows, pretty stark in, in a lot of area, a lot of islands, not all the islands, pretty barren because the islands are really low in elevation. Uh, now, we saw some really nice habitat when we got up in higher elevations on uh, Santa Cruz Island. But I think I was a little taken back that, you know, there was so much recent volcanic activity. I, I even Googled yesterday, when was the most recent volcanic eruption in the Galapagos? And it started March 4th last month. Oh, wow. and, and it's erupting like right now. So the, the islands are very similar to Hawaii in the sense that they are still being created. There's like a hot spot that the te plate tectonics is moving over and it's just keep putting up um, more lava and it's creating more islands and enlarging islands. And so there were a lot of fascinating, I had lots of pictures of lava because I just found it really pretty. And I found this interesting site. Uh, uh, fortunately, she got out of the lava, so we're all safe. But what does that look like? 
you know, it looks similar to saguaro. Um, it's really interesting to see how over time, after you've had a recent lava flow, plants start inhabiting the island. You start to have this uh, small little weeds and little cactus and then these larger cactus and this progression of plants uh, recolonizing an island or a lava area. Um, <laughs> these are some of the s local sea lions. Uh, this is Pelican Bay on Santa Cruz Island. And they're right at home, as you can tell. Uh, I took several pictures of sea lions just because I thought it was funny that they're taking up the benches that are for people. <laughs> so the wildlife is very tame and they don't really care about you. It's like you're there and they're there and we're fine. So uh, this was a young sea lion and he was on a, a sidewalk, right in the middle of the sidewalk. And you know, they do kind of have guidelines that you're not supposed to approach within like six feet of wildlife or something like that. And I mean, I could have easily touched it. I mean, it was like here to there. Uh, but this guy has an itch, and uh, I just thought he was really cute. So, um, abundance of wildlife all around you. So, I, I, and then this was my very first time of seeing uh, penguins in the wild. I've never been anywhere where I, I've been able to observe penguins in the wild. And um, so this was, um, not St. James, yeah, Santiago. Mm -hmm. So um, Galapagos penguins, which is an endemic species to that part, and first time seeing penguins. Uh, striated heron, some of these I'm just going to kind of run through. These are also common on the mainland. Um, you can see them in the Amazon and other parts of the mainland. Well, yeah, there's lots of crabs. And then this is a brown pelican sitting up on a rock by some cactus that looks like it just came right out of Tucson or something, you know, some prickly pear, um, and blue-footed boobies. Um, certainly, they're very uh, common in the Galapagos. Um, a lot of American oyster catchers, and I, I'm just quite taken by American oyster catchers. I just think that's a really, really cool bird. Um, and I actually got a picture of one sitting on a nest. And it's kind of interesting because there were um, Galapagos hawks like flying overhead. And you see how he's got his head kind of cocked? It's like being predator conscious. You know, it's like looking up, like, okay, what's up there flying around? Um, just cool to see the behavior, to see the nest. Um, this is, I'm not even looking at my notes. I probably should look at my notes. Um, this is a lava gull, and it is the rarest gull in the world. I'm not sure how many few hundred, and they're only found in the Galapagos Islands, so it's an endemic species. And I really like seeing endemic species. To me, that's very meaningful to see a species that you cannot see anywhere else in the world. Um, and so it's not a great picture, but I included it just because it was something that we got to see that's very rare. We saw, I saw two or three, because I saw some in Pelican Bay when I was on my own, but we saw one at Baltra when we were waiting to take the um, this isn't a great picture, but it's a brown knotty. But the reason I included it, one of the things I liked about this trip is I got to see some bird behavior that I've never witnessed in my life. And I didn't have a picture of this. But when we were in Baltra, waiting to get on the panga to get to the yacht, the knotties, which is a species of tern, and terns typically dive beak first into the water and catch small fish. They were literally landing on the head of brown pelicans. And when you know brown pelicans, when they catch fish with their, their pouch, and then the water's pouring out like a sieve, they were like catching the fish that were escaping from the pelican's beak. And it's like that learned behavior fascinated me. I've never seen that behavior anywhere I've ever birded, and I'm 60 some odd years old, and I've seen lots of terns and I've seen lots of pelicans, but I've never seen another tern species land on the head of a pelican. And it's learned that, hey, when a pelican scoops, it's going to have fish in there, and some of them are going to escape, and I'm going to be right there to peck at them. So, pretty cool. So, sometimes there's disappointments on a trip, and this trip was, was not without exception. Um, Prior to the trip, we'd had a meeting here in Prescott with Tom and Edie, and they went with our Prescott group 
talking about the different islands and what we're going to see and what we're going to do. And Tom looked right at me. He's like, I can't wait to see your face when we get to Henevesa. You're going to be blown away when we get to Henevesa. So Henevesa is a fairly small island that Darwin visited. And um, it has a lot of nesting seabirds that you can just like walk through. You know, like they're just all over, apparently. I've never seen it. But we were going to go there. And the night before we were to go there, they announced that the island had been closed because it had avian flu, bird flu. And we were not allowed to go on the island. And this was, cause this was to be like the highlight of the Galapagos Islands, the island that you were going to see the most amazing birds. And it was like at 5 o'clock when we met every night in the galley to discuss the next day's calendar that was announced. We're not going there tomorrow. And this was one of the birds that was found on that island. And I was really disappointed, because I've never seen a swallow-tailed gull before, and I probably would never see one again. I was there, close. Well, the next day, or two days later, it was the last night on the yacht. The people that were working on the yacht were preparing a special dinner. And we were sitting on the back of the boat, all of us, I think all 17 of us, were just sitting on the back of the boat, just chit-chatting and talking. And I was talking to Tom, and I was kind of facing this way, and Tom was sitting here facing this way. And all of a sudden, Tom saw a bird flying. It's pitch dark. OK, pitch dark. Saw a bird drafting off the side of the ship in the dark. And he said, swallowtail gull. And this is one of the few times I did not have my binoculars on me. Like, I sleep with my binoculars. And I literally ran. I mean, I got up and I just ran into the ship, ran down the hall, ran into my room, grabbed my binoculars, ran back out. And a swallowtailed gull was drafting off the side of the boat. And there was lights on the boat. And so some of that light was reflecting off of the gull. It was like a ghost bird. And it stayed with us for probably 20 minutes. And sometimes it was on the left side of the boat, and then sometimes it would kind of drift back, and then all of a sudden it would reappear on the right side of the boat. And then sometimes it would kind of get ahead of the boat. And so we would run upstairs to the top deck and get on the edge, and we were looking at it. And then it would kind of disappear into the night like a ghost. And then all of a sudden it would be over here. And I got to see a swallow-tailed gull. So what's really cool about this uh, particular gull, I wrote some notes just because I want to share this with you. I'm talking way too much, but that's what I'm here to do, right? Um, it is the only fully nocturnal gull and seabird in the world. It preys on squid and small fish, which rise to the surface at night to feed on, feed on plankton. And so while we didn't get to go to Henevesa, I got to see this bird, which was really, really cool. So um, I'm going to go forward, but if the video catches, I'm going to go back. And then see if it'll, yeah, it's going to catch. So we'll see if it, going back, will help it go forward. Um, this is at Rabida, the lagoon, Rabida. And there was a lagoon. And we encountered a small flock of American uh, flamingos. And it was really funny. When we arrived at the lagoon, they were pretty much farther on the other end of the lagoon. And they just walked right towards us and walked right past us. And it's like, thank you. Thank you very much. So I just thought that was really cool to have such an up-close look at uh, Fleming. Look at his neck. He's preening. Uh, just fascinating. Uh, while we were also on um, one of the Galapagos Islands, uh, I think it was Santa Cruz, we got to go in a small lava tube. Um, and then we also, of course, saw lots of tortoises. And so this is a cattle egret. I think this is funny because look at the next picture. There's a common cow and it's like, I'm not sure what the behavior is, why they want to be on top of the tortoise. Uh, maybe the little vantage point, you know, can see a little bit better, get some elevation. But it's funny that both of these birds were sitting up on top of uh, tortoises. And um, we did go to the Darwin Research Center while we were there as well. I didn't include any pictures in this where they are captive breeding and raising tortoises that they're going to be reintroducing to the different isle, islands because they have different species of turtles that are tortoises that are found on specific islands. So um, we got some great pictures of tortoises and iguanas, uh, marine iguanas, uh, which are found in the Galapagos. This is one of those funny stories where, you know, like 
your whole life, you're like, I want to go see Darwin Finches. Wouldn't it be amazing to see Darwin Finches? And then you see him inside the airport eating off of people's plates, and it kind of cheapens the experience. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I want to see one of these rare birds that helped forge Darwin's theory of evolution. How amazing would that be? And they're inside the airport <laughs> eating off of people's plates. Um, it's like, well, I got to see him, right? So, <laughs> kind of a funny experience. <laughs> Thank you, Walt. Uh, very good. So, I'm going to move on. You know, the, the, our portion of the trip for the Galapagos was just about a five-day portion of the 21-day trip. So, I'm going to continue on. When we got back to the mainland, um, one of the places we went to was San Isidro, which is like an eco lodge in a rainforest. Would you call it a rainforest or cloud forest? Wow. Cloud forest. And it rained all the time, but it was a cloud forest. Um, and at the lodge, they had a lot of bird feeders, but they also had this. Can you, can you see what it is? Bugs, yeah. So below the deck, suspended from a wooden beam between these two cement pillars is like a white sheet. And at night, they put a light on it. And, and what it does, like any light at night, it attracts insects, mostly moths, by the thousands. And they, I mean, they're all over the pillar, and they're on the ground, and they're all over this sheet, and they're on the deck. And then in the morning, when it starts to get daylight, all these birds <laughs> in the jungle come out of the forest and start feeding on all these moths. So it's like a moth feeder. Uh, but it's all natural. I mean, they weren't putting out anything, you know, like artificial food, like a sugar feeder or something like that. But um, this, is, this is one of the birds uh, that was coming to feed on the moths. And it would literally land right on the railing of the deck. And it would be like this close. You know, it's like almost so close you couldn't get your camera on it. Um, this is the male masked uh, trogon. This is the female masked trogon. And I just included these bird pictures here, even though I'm not really getting into birds yet, just because at this particular lodge, we had the opportunity to see so many amazing birds that were attracted to the moth trap, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is another interesting bird that looks very similar to a bird we have here in Arizona. If you think of the dusky-capped flycatcher, this is a pale-edged flycatcher, and it's in the same family, the Myarchus family. It looks very, very similar, and that was taken from the deck. Um, and we're going to get into hummingbirds a little bit. Um, I felt really cheated because, yeah, look at the tail on some of these hummingbirds. A racket tail, a long-tailed sylph. Um, there are, you ready, 133 species of hummingbirds in Ecuador. Who wants to go to Ecuador? Yeah, <laughs> raise your hand. Yeah. 133 species of just hummingbirds in Ecuador. And I only saw 37. <laughs> I, hold, I hold Tom responsible for that. No. no. Uh, yeah, I want my money back. I forgot to mention, like that pale edged. Oops, I went forward. I cheated. Th this guy. 199 flycatcher species in Ecuador. Just in the flycatcher family, 199. Incredible diversity of birds. I already showed you this one, I cheated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this was at a location um, where there are feeders, and they're very used to people. And I took some video, too. Um, this is Gayla, my wife, holding her hand, and this is a white-legged, um, puff-legged, white puff-legged, um, booted, booted, white booted, white booted, ratchet, racket tail. Yeah. Um, they're really a delicate little hummingbird, but isn't that tail and those feathers on the on the feet just incredible? Um, so. There, we went to a few lodges where they had feeders, and it was just mind-blowing. Just absolutely mind-blowing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forward. 
They're very curious, huh, Gail? So when Gail wasn't bird watching, which was most of the time, <laughs> she was knitting. And she was knitting something red. <laughs> and literally landing on the needle, on her hand, flying around, checking out this red material. It's like, what's this? Is it food? So uh, pretty incredible. Um, this is another video that I shot. Um, if we watch it long enough, there are five different species in this picture. So uh, right there at the top flying in is an empress, brilliant, just exiting the screen. On the right-hand side is a white-necked white -necked Jacobin. There's an empress again, brilliant. And then um, in a second, another one's going to come flying in. Um, another empress. Look at the forked tail. Just incredible. And then um, here, oh no, here's another uh, coronet. There's a cor another coronet. Um, stunning colors. Just, oh, here comes the little guy. So right here is this, this little green thorn tail uh, coming in. And he's actually very delicate. Well, look at his tiny little tail tips. And you can see how little he is in comparison. Um, and that was probably about, I don't know, this far away. Yeah, that's a green brilliant, green crowned brilliant. So um, these were some of the experiences that we were having. This is my hand, and um, they would literally just land on my fingers. My fingers were like perches. So if you watch, they just land right on my fingers and feed from the flowers. So this was at a lodge that I went to independently of the group. I went to a place called uh, Mashpi Amagusa. And at this particular lodge, the owner of the lodge just put some flowers in my hand. And as soon as he put the flowers on my hand, the hummingbirds were just coming up and landing uh, on my fingers. So really, really incredible uh, to have that experience. So many different colors and varieties. <sighs> so this is another story. So I've never been to a canopy tower before. I've wanted to go to Panama for a long time because they have canopy towers and canopy camps. And this was my first experience in the Amazon basin of actually having the opportunity to go up a canopy tower. You can see this stairwell that's parallel to the trunk of the tree going up into the canopy of the forest. It's pretty impressive. Um, this is me about three quarters, 80% of the way up, almost to the top. And then this is the top. It is literally a metal platform with a railing uh, all around it. And there's the baby scope. We'll talk more about the baby scope. Um, but on the far right, you'll see like a little walkway. That little walkway connects you to the stairwell. That's how you got up there. And then you came across this little walkway. And we literally stayed up on this canopy tower for several hours. This is a Ciba tree. And they grow to be about 200 feet tall. And so you're literally, it's the tallest tree in the, in the Amazon basin there. And so you're looking down on the tops of the trees in the forest. And you're watching macaws flying across the jungle below you. Or you're watching parrots. Uh, while we were up there, we saw dwarf marmoset monkeys from the tower. And our guide was super, super excited about that find. And they're just like squirrel-sized monkeys. They're like the smallest monkeys in the world. And we saw them from, from the canopy tower. So this was one of those really special experiences for me to have the opportunity to bird from a canopy. And then somebody took a picture of some of us down below. Uh, and they weren't at the top. They were already like halfway down the stairs. I think maybe Delisa went back up the stairs like six flights and then just took a picture down. Uh, but we were. We were way up. That's the trunk of the tree, by the way. Part of the trunk of the tree with its buttresses. Um, this is a picture of a tree in one of the camps that we stayed at, Sawney Lodge, of um, russet backed oropendulas and yellow rubbed kaziks. They make these pendulum hanging nests and they're very, very noisy. They, they squabble and bicker a lot. And uh, while we were there, we did a hike in the <laughs> rainforest. And we got to see the leaf cutter ants at work, which is, you know, you see these nature shows on TV and you see these things, but to experience it firsthand is just really awesome to get to, to witness it and, and be a part of that. 
And it just goes on and on. I mean, it's like it just disappears into the jungle and you can't even see it anymore, the trail. Um, and then there was Lucy. <laughs> so at, the, at Sonny Lodge, the workers, they go, here, Lucy, 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 Lucy. And this caiman would swim across the lagoon and come over. They knew it was feeding time. And let's see how well this works. It's going to catch. So I'm going to go back. And then I'm going to go back and see if it won't catch. So it's not the, ah, come on, baby. Oh, maybe it's not going to work. It's a great video. They're feeding a chicken on a string with a stick. And you know, uh, the stick's like six feet long, and this guy's like down in the water trying to get it to, I was hoping I could get it to work. They're catching for some reason. Oh, no. OK. Well, anyways, he got the chicken. So. <laughs> Um, we spent several days at Sonny Lodge, and we did like day trips out and back uh, several times from Sonny Lodge. And um, one of the days we went to uh, Yasuni National Park, right on the, the banks of the river. And before that, we stopped at this clay lick where the parrots and parakeets would come in and, and land on this mud faced, it's not really a cliff, but like there was a landslide probably at some point. And there was um, clay that obviously has minerals that they need as part of their diet. And we got to see a lot of, uh, let's see if this video will work. We were in a boat, so it's rocky, I apologize. But up here you can see blue-headed uh, blue parrots, and then these really dark, kind of dark green par uh, parakeets, dusky-headed parakeets, and then these lighter green par uh, mealy parrots, and I, I apologize for the quality of the video, but like I said, we were in a boat, uh, and they kept us offshore a distance from, from the uh, clay lick, but we got to witness this behavior, which again, I've seen in movies, but I've never seen it in person, you know, so that was pretty cool. Probably one of the highlights for me, you know, when you go on a birding trip, you kind of have target birds. It's like, I'd love to see this bird on this trip, whatever that bird is. Well, you're about to see what one of those birds is. So this was our guide on a day that we went up to the high country. And he's holding a feather. What kind of bird do you think that feather came from? A condor. Andean condor. And this was a really cool day. You know, by now, everybody in the group knew that I was crazy about birds. And as the bus was getting to this little pullout where there was a little viewing area, and I was like, I think I see a condor. They're like, let Eric out first. And they're like, Eric, Eric, Eric. <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of ridiculous, but it's true. It's a true story. Because like, I was sitting in the back of the bus, so I ran through the center of the bus and got off the bus first. Sure enough, we saw condors. Uh, and we didn't just see a few. We saw quite a few. I mean, we saw about 16 at this particular place. But. Um, what was really cool is we were on this little viewing platform, and bet between us, there was like a ravine, a, you know, a canyon, and then a cliff face for a mile or so, you know, just spread across. And we could see some condors flying, and we could see some perched. We had scopes, and we got them in scopes. But while we're in the viewing platform, I saw a falcon, and I started going, falcon, 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 trying to get people's attention to, to hey, there's a falcon. And it ended up being a peregrine falcon. And we walked from that platform down to a little restaurant where they had hummingbird feeders. And I'm going to tie all this together. On the platform, we saw the largest flying bird in the world. We saw the fastest flying bird in the world. And then at the little restaurant that we walked to five minutes away, we saw the largest hummingbird in the world. It's called a giant hummingbird. It's about the length of a cardinal. Now, it's not the girth of a cardinal, but you know, it's about yay long. Yeah. And so within just minutes of each other, we saw the largest flying bird in the world, the fastest flying bird in the world, the largest hummingbird in the world, and we saw the second largest hummingbird in the world at that restaurant as well. So pretty incredible experiences. And what was funny is our guide, uh, this guy, David, he was actually more excited about the peregrine than the, than the he was. He's like, we never see peregrines. I'm so excited we got to see a peregrine. So that was kind of funny to share that with the guide. By the way, he's holding my binoculars. <laughs> the wingspan's about 13 feet. So it is a very, very large bird. 
And we saw quite a few. So we saw them originally in this um, canyon habitat, and then we went up higher. We kept going higher and higher, and this habitat's called Paramo. And I, I did write a few notes about it. I should probably refer to my notes every once in a while. But at this point, we were probably over 13,000 feet in elevation around there. And um, so I just share this with you. The northern Andean Paramo ecoregion includes the high altitude wet grasslands that are above tree line but below the snow line within the equatorial Andes. The Paramo contains among the highest biodiversity of high altitude open vegetation types in the world. Special adaptations of Paramo vegetation have led to its ability to survive the extreme cold, high winds, we experienced all that, uh, intense ultraviolet rays, frost, high elevation, abrupt climate change, and even fire. So um, we drove through this habitat on our way to a reservoir. And at one point, the driver was driving the bus. It was a nice bus. And I go, stop the bus, stop the bus. <laughs> I was yelling because I saw condors on the ground in the distance, like, you know, way back in the distance. And so they stopped the bus. And our guide was all excited. And we all got out, and we got our scopes out, and people were taking pictures. And then some condors flew over us, so it was pretty cool. Then we all got back in the bus, and we were driving again. And guess what? Pretty soon I yell, stop the bus, stop the bus. And we found what's called the Andean, or black-faced ibis. Found five of them. So I spotted them. We stopped the bus again. We all got out of the bus. And again, our guide was super excited that we were seeing these amazing birds. And um, so that was pretty special to see some of these rare birds in the high elevation. Um, this is a cinnamon flycatcher. Oh, it's actually a video. Let's see if it works. Yes, it's raining. Um, so I actually shot that video with the uh, AX Visio, with these flycatchers, er, fly with these binoculars. So um, but I just thought that was really cool. It really is demonstrates how flycatchers, they're constantly moving their head, you know, when they're perched, because they're looking for an insect to fly by. Um, this is an Andean putu. Um, you know, it's really nice when you have local guides, because they, they walk you right to it. Um, this was a day where it had just rained and rained and rained in the morning, and finally the rain let up, and they're like, OK, let's go on a walk. And we walked on a road. And they took us right to this spot where we could see an Andean putu. So that was pretty cool. This is a heron. This was at Sawney Lodge, a co uh, Kokoi heron. Um, Rufus colored sparrow. Looks a lot like our sparrows, huh? Just different colors. Um, golden olive woodpecker at Alambi. Um, this is a video, let's see if it'll work, that I took with the, yes, it's raining. Uh, <laughs> But I took with those binoculars, again, the AX Visios. And um, so here, here comes another one. This is a rose-faced parrot. And this was at uh, Amagusa. And so I did a one-day extension. So I was by myself with a one-on-one -on -one with a guide. And um, on that particular day, we saw 104 species in one day. And about half of those were life birds for me. So I was really happy that I did that one day extension. Um, I, abandoned, yeah, I, I abandoned my wife. I left the group. Uh, I got dropped off <laughs> like a coffee shop and uh, waited for my guide to show up. And he showed up. And it all worked out. And then this is also a video that I shot. Uh, come on. Go forward and see if it'll run. No, it's catching. Sorry. Um, it's actually a really good video once it gets started. It's a uh, kawadi. It's an Andean kawadi. Um, so I saw that at Amagusa, too. But I think what I'd like to do is kind of wrap up. I don't know how long I'm going. Oh, I need to wrap up by talking a little bit about birds. So um, I generally don't do a lot of bird photography. I do just more looking. And so I went to eBird, and I pulled some pictures off. But I just want to give you an example of some of the amazing birds that we saw. This was in the Galapagos. This is the, an endemic. It's the Galapagos dove. Um, this is the uh, black-tailed train bearer. 
<laughs> that's the name of it. It's a, it's a hummingbird, but uh, it's just got this enormous long tail. Gail and I saw several of these at the Quito uh, Botanical Gardens, which was pretty cool. We got to see these in the Botanical Gardens. Um, this is a torrent duck. This is one of those species that I got really excited about when I found it. Uh, because it was like a target bird. I want to see a torrent duck. And we got to see a male and female several times. And literally, they are in these raging rivers that are boulder strewn. And the water is just like crashing all around them. And they just like go on top of the water to go from one boulder to the next. And it's like, how do they even do that and not just get swept away? So it was really cool to see torrent ducks. Uh, we saw three owl species. This is a black banded owl that we got two nights in a row at the San Isidro Lodge. And um, I just get really excited when I see nocturnal birds because there's a lot of owls in those habitats and you rarely see them. Um, this was a really fun find. Um, this is a toucan barbette. So it's a barbette, but it's got a beak kind of like a toucan. And it's not a real big bird. And um, the, the owner of the lodge in Amagusa uh, he had a gift. He had a way with birds. He, he knew what they ate, and he knew how to feed them, and he would call them. And so he would take out a banana and open it up and cut it in some sections and put it out, and then he'd start whistling. And the birds would just start coming. It's like they knew it was feeding time. And he just called this bird in by whistling. It's really, really incredible. So this is a male, Andean cock of the rock. Uh, I had seen the Guyanan cock of the rock in Brazil years ago, and certainly this was a target bird. Um, and we went to a lodge where we had lunch, and then after it rained for a couple hours, <laughs> we got on our mud boots and we walked through the forest, and they took us right to a lek where the males were doing their little dancing and performing for the females. And our whole group got to see probably about a dozen of the the male uh, Andean cock of the rock. This is a Watsin. Yeah, uh, they were quite common at uh, Sani Lodge. We saw a lot from the lodge. Um, this is an orange-breasted um, fruit eater. Saw several, uh, particularly at, um, I think, San Isidro. No, that was a different fruit eater, but I saw these at Amagusa. A black-capped Donacobius. Saw that at Sani uh, at, um, Lodge. So I, I had to do this just for Tom, <laughs> see if Tom could control his emotions. So you've heard of tanagers? Guess how many tanager species are in Ecuador? We have like five in North America, scarlet, western, hepatic, summer, I don't know, maybe four or five. 105 tanager species in Ecuador. I'm going to show you pictures of just four because they're so mind-boggling. So this is the paradise tanager, which we saw from the canopy tower. We were on top of that tower, you know, almost 200 feet up in the forest, looking across at a tree, and we could see it in the top treetops. This is a glistening green tanager. It's just hard to describe these birds. You have to see them. They're just amazing. This is a masked crimson tanager. And this is a hooded? Oh, I can't remember the name. Um, I've got it right here. Hooded mountain tanager. So these are just four examples of tanager plumage and tanager species of the 105 species. I forgot to count how many we saw. I know I saw 37 hummingbird species of the 133. I'd be curious to know. I've got it written down. I don't know how many I'd have to count. But we probably saw 30 to. 30 to 40 tanager species on the trip. It's really incredible. And this is a mannequin, golden-headed mannequin and a wire-tailed mannequin. So there, you know, when you get into the tropics, when you get into the Amazon basin, the, the colors, the diversity, um, Ecuador has, is the, the country with the most species diversity in the world. There's close to 1,700 species in Ecuador. And Ecuador is approximately similar in size to Colorado. So you think about Colorado. If you look at, you, know, you think Colorado is a big state. Well, look at the entire United States. Colorado is not that big when you look at the landmass of the you know, continental United States. So then you take that same size and apply it to Ecuador. 
and say almost 1,700 species. In eBird, I looked at it, it says Colorado has recorded 517 species. So more than three times the amount of species uh, in, in that same amount of space. But you have, you go from sea level all the way up to over 20,000 feet in elevation. And so you have all these different habitats, like I mentioned, rainforest, cloud forest, paramo, Andes, um, Amazon basin. And so you have this incredible diversity of birds. So on that note, there's a happy birder. <laughs> so I, I never quit birding. I think you know that about me. So when we got back to Quito, uh, a fellow birder, her name was Laura, uh, she was pretty interested in birds. Like, hey, Laura, do you want to go birding? So I abandoned Gala again. And we got a taxi. And it took us to Teleferico. And I went back up to Teleferico again. So we're about 12,800 feet. And uh, we went birding up there. And I'm repping Swarovski. So I got my Swarovski hat, my Swarovski jacket, my Swarovski gloves, my Swarovski binoculars, my Swarovski scope, which I brought today uh, to do my Swarovski commercial. Uh, so anyways, it was an amazing trip. Uh, you can see Quito in the background. Um, I thank Tom and Edie for putting this together. Um, the program that they put together is going to run again, and I just want to share this with you. I, I should have said this earlier. Um, there are four interconnected organizations that collaborate to secure the success of the program. There's the Eco Studio Foundation, the Andean Study Programs, uh, Hotel Casa Folk, and the uh, Eco Minda Foundation. And so Tom and Edie have worked with these organizations. It's kind of a fundraiser for these organizations. Ecominda has, um, has protected about 20,000 acres in Ecuador. And we got to go boots on the ground to some of their properties with guided tours with some of their staff. Their guides, their, some of their staff were our guides for several days. Um, one of the things that's really unique about Ecuador, and I'll wrap up with this, is in 2008, Ecuador became the first country to officially recognize that nature has constitutional rights. This was included in the country's constitution under Article 71, where it states that nature has the right to exist, persist, maintain, and regenerate its vital cycles, structure, functions, and its processes and evolution. What an incredible thing to put into your constitution and I mean, that's really a model for the world. And there's a lot of room for improvement that we could do in our own country and in other countries to mirror that kind of emphasis to protect the diversity of plants and birds and animals that occur in these incre incredible places. So on that note, I will quit talking. And anybody have any questions? Thank you. Yes, John. Sure. So I think that the question was, if you can't hear it, are the Andean condors threatened? Certainly they are. I think our guide David told us that in Ecuador they have 157 of them. Now their pot, their their range extends outside of Ecuador. It certainly goes down into Peru, maybe into Bolivia. I know it goes into Peru quite a bit. So there's there's certainly a, a larger population than 157, but there's only 157 in the entire country of Ecuador. So yeah, they're threatened. Don't I remember that the, the pair that we saw were having like one or two eggs every year? They normally only have three or four. That's what he said. Yeah. yeah. So they were being highly productive, which is good. Yep. Helping the species come back. And interestingly, the, uh, the place that we eat lunch on the day that we see the condor, the family had formerly been a ranching family and somewhat in conflict because they were worried that the condors would kill the calves. But Tombo Condor now, the place where we eat lunch, is run by the son of the family who runs it as an eco tourism destination rather than in conflict with Congress. So it's a, it's a shift. A, me? It's a shift in and their it's mindset. It's a shift and a, and a story that you see really fairly frequently in Ecuador where the tourism supports conservation. Mm -hmm. 
I, I will tell you that the guides, the local guides that we had were absolutely amazing. They were so in touch with nature and so in tune. Um, they were just incredible at finding birds and just finding wildlife in general. It was just a thrill to be with them. They were really incredible. John. Well, mostly, yeah, they're mostly carrion, but they're certainly capable of killing things. They, they pluck out their eyes and then they go blind and then they can then they die and then you eat them so yeah there's they they're not a bird of prey in that sense but they'll literally pluck out their eyes and then they go blind and then they die and so yeah other good questions <laughs> let's leave on a positive note <laughs> gonna have bad dreams tonight <laughs> Doug Uh-huh. I don't personally know, but it doesn't seem to affect them. I mean, you saw in that video at the feeder, they just choom, 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 just like a regular hummingbird. Yeah. I mean, I watched them at the botanical gardens and... <laughs> doesn't seem to affect them. It's pretty incredible to watch them. Any other question? 133. Mm -hmm. Do they, any of them migrate? Um, not that I'm aware of, but... Not very far. Yeah. yeah. Hummingbirds, Maybe. hummingbirds actually are an Ecuadorian invention. That's where their center of distribution, that's where their evolution began. Then they, just, then they radiated out from there. But then, so there are a few that enter some altitude long. Yeah. 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 But, but they're mostly resident hummingbirds. Yeah. And that's why I only saw 37, truly. Yes. Because if I wanted to see all 133, I have to go different regions in different parts of the country because some of them, you look at the range maps and they're very, found in very restricted locations. And some of them are very endangered. I mean, there's very limited numbers on some of them. But some of them, like one of the ones I was particularly looking for, and the reason I wanted to go back up to Teleferico the last day, the tram, I was looking for the Ecuadorian hill star. And it's found at about 13,000 feet, 12,000 feet in elevation. Didn't get it. I went up there twice, took the tram up there at the beginning of the trip and at the end of the trip just to see that species, and I didn't see it. Um, so, you know, some of them are found at really incredible elevations. Mary. Can you uh, describe the, um, the lek for the Kakarot? Oh. I mean, what? You know, you get so caught up in the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, it was jungle. I mean, we were in the cloud forest. Um, the visibility, in my opinion, wasn't great. It had been raining a lot. They were kind of backlit um, because it was overcast and they were more like a silhouette from, for the most part, depending on what elevation uh, in the tree, you know, strata of the tree they were in. So I, I didn't want to stay there long because they had split our groups into two and my, I was with the first wave and I wanted to make sure that we left quickly so the second group could see them too. That, to me, was important, and fortunately they did. So they were, they were doing their displays in the trees? Yeah. Yeah, they're mostly up in branches. Yeah, yeah. It's not like a picture like a dancing grouse. Like a grouse or something, yeah. Oh, yeah, there were several at the waterfall, at the Devil's Cauldron, yep. So they were dancing on the branches? Yeah, yeah. No, it was mid-afternoon, probably three-ish in the afternoon. See, most, most leks are very early in the morning, but this yeah. one particular one, they, they do it in the late afternoon. Yeah. Kind of blind? Nope. nope. Mm -mm. They knew we were there, because uh, we, we went in about two groups of ten. So our group of ten went, and then we retreated so the next group of ten could go in and see them, and then they retreated. And interestingly, after we all kind of got back together, a group of twenty, we saw another one. And then like two days later, when we went to that waterfall, the Devil's Cauldron, we ended up seeing several females. Didn't see any males, but they, were, they had nest. And I actually got some pretty good pictures with the AX Visio of a female that was pretty darn close. So I didn't anticipate seeing them again, but we saw them several times, which was a really bonus, no bonus. Any other questions? 
I welcome you to come up, look at anything, and uh, you have any questions? Sure. Why doesn't everybody that was on the trip stand up? So we've, we've got Mary Kay and Mary and Gayla and um, I'm not going to say Edie, but it's not Edie, <laughs> Abby. <laughs> that would be a compliment. The Lisa, Gail, and then Edie, and then Tom. And these two are our local leaders putting all this together. And they're going to be going again in January next year. We've got flyers up here if you want to go next year in January. Um, so it's a great trip. Thank you. Thank you.